Welcome to London First Baptist Church. We're glad you're here today. Uh, we're excited about what God has done through our West Africa mission team. They're back and dragging a little bit, I think, but uh, they had a great week, I think. Uh, we have a guest speaker this morning. You'll hear more about it in a little bit, but Ryan Scantling is speaking. He's the BCM director at the University of Arkansas. I've known him since he's probably about 14 years old, something like that. And I've known his wife since she was two. Uh, she was one of ours. And so I um, always love getting to see them, getting to be around them a little bit. So we're excited to be here, here today. We're going to begin our worship service. And the call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 99. Let's stand. The Lord reigns. Let the people strengthen. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the people. <coughs> Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. Amen. Let's sing to the king.
guys. And if I sound a little bit hoarse, that's because, you know, Africa. <laughs> Africa. <laughs> just, uh, there was, uh, I picked something up during the week while we were there, and uh, I, I know this, between that and just getting back, we've been back, we've been less than 40 hours, I think, about now, and I am really thankful that Ryan was here tonight. <laughs> and I have no doubt that you are, you are as well. I know Alan's already introduced him a little bit later on this morning. Ryan Scatlin will be up here to share God's word. Looking forward to having him here to be a part of our services this morning and hearing what God has to say to us through him. Let me also say thank you for all of you who have been praying for the team that was in Guinea over the last week and a half or so. Uh, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, I am so thankful for all that God did through all three of us that Bobby uh, and Tammy were just fantastic throughout the entire week and uh, very grateful how God used them and how they connected with so many students and the people we talked to, uh, talked with throughout the course of the uh, week or so that we were there. Uh, you would be proud if you got a chance to see them, what God did through them. And I'm very grateful for having the week to spend with them there in West Africa. Next Sunday morning, uh, when we've had a chance to sleep a little bit and gather our thoughts, you'll have a chance to hear some of that, uh, some of the information, some of the things that we did last week and You'll have a chance to hear about some of that and see some of it next Sunday morning. So I want to put that in front of you and hope you'll be a part of that next Sunday. This morning we are going to take some time to pray. Because as you guys know, prayer is part of worship. And we're going to take some time this morning to lift up uh, to the Lord our heart, our concerns, and ask Him to speak to us. As we do that, we'll let the scriptures guide us. So from, uh, okay. I've got uh, uh, yeah, Acts chapter 3 and verse 17. We'll read this and then we'll pray. And now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance just as your rulers did also. But the things that, which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, that Christ would suffer, he is thus fulfilled. Therefore, repent and return, so your sins may be wiped away, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus. The Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. And it will be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. So obviously speaking of Christ and in very many ways, this was the message we brought, or at least tried to bring to so many people uh, this last week and a half in, in West Africa. And so this morning as we pray, we pray that the those that we spoke to last week in that part of the world would heed and listen to all that was said, and that perhaps you had the chance maybe this last week and a half or last week or so to share the gospel here. I hope that was the case, and we hope that that was also well received. So if you will join with me in bowing your head closing your eyes, would you begin your own prayer time this morning by praising God for the offer of salvation that was made possible through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And as you praise him for the salvation through Christ, would you also thank the Lord for the opportunities the team had last week or so to share in West Africa, for the conversations with the people that they met, and the seeds that were planted. also pray this morning that God would water those seeds, that God would work in the hearts and the minds of those who heard the gospel last week, and those who will continue to hear it through the ministry of the mission's team that's there in Congress for the long term. Would you pray that God would bring some to salvation? Pray this morning that God would open up your own eyes and ears 
to hear, to see the need and the brokenness of those around you, that you'll be around this week. Pray that God will point out to you opportunities to share the gospel. Heavenly Father, as we approach your throne this morning, as we sing praises to you, as we look back at the last several days and acknowledge all that you have done for us, as we even look forward to the next week and consider all that you might do for and even through us, we begin by thanking you for the salvation that's possible through Christ. We thank you that you, seeing us in our brokenness and our, our rebellion, loved us so much that you sent Christ to suffer and sacrifice his life for us. We thank you for those you sent to us with the gospel. Lord, we also thank you for using this church to send others to share the gospel, not only here in the River Valley, but around the world. Lord, you know the, the numbers that heard the gospel this past week. Lord, you know the openness they had or did not have. We pray that all those who heard your word this last week, that, Father, you would make their hearts open, their lives uh, sensitive to all that was said. We pray that the gospel seed that was planted this week would, in fact, begin to grow. That, Lord, it would produce fruit for eternal life. Lord, I pray not only for those that we met this last week and a half or so, but I pray for the Shores. I pray for all the members of the, of the team that's there that we met with this last week. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen them, that you would encourage them, that you would give them wisdom. The Lord, the Lord you would continue to lead them to encounter those who do not know you, that they may share the, the truth of the gospel. And then, Father, you would lead them to those whose hearts are ready to hear the truth of the scripture. Father, we also pray that even as we continue your work here in Arkansas, that you would, as we go throughout the rest of our week, take us away from the busyness of our own lives. And that, Father, we would see the need, the brokenness, the hearts around us that desperately need the gospel. And that, Lord, we would, upon seeing those opportunities and seeing that need, be quick with what you have given us. In the grace of Christ, the truth of the Spirit. Father, may we be a church of the people this week, eager to take to others what you have said to us, the truth of the gospel. We ask these things in Jesus' name.
so great to be here at London First Baptist. Uh, my family has a lot of history here. Every church that I go and speak in, as I work for Arkansas Baptist State Convention, is compared to London First Baptist because Allie, my wife, of course, grew up here. You guys raised her, so thank you, thank you for that. I, I'm so thankful for you in so many ways. You may not realize it, but you are one of 1,564 Arkansas Southern Baptist churches in our state. And each Sunday, when you give, a portion of that goes to a thing called the Cooperative Program for World Missions. And that supports things from missionaries in uh, East Asia to church planters in Canada to me and what I do, Baptist Collegiate Ministry, right there at the University of Arkansas. So I just have to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Your influence is felt all across the state, the nation, and the world. In addition to that, uh, you have some incredible staff folks, folks that are leading you on mission, but also uh, your youth pastor is a legend in the state of Arkansas. I don't know if you realize that, but Alan is one of the longest serving, most tenured uh, there are a lot of churches who would love to have Alan Johnson on their staff. And so I'm just so incredibly thankful for you. I'm just a boy who grew up south of the Arkansas River. And so uh, you guys were always a little bit more upscale to me. Anybody north of the river just had it figured out. And so I grew up in Yale County. And you'll turn with me to Luke chapter 14. That's where we'll be this morning, Luke chapter 14. I'm going to read out the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible. Not because it's any more holy or inspired, but because it was translated on the 8th grade reading level. And that helps me, growing up in Dardanelle. So it's just a good, good thing. Luke 14. Uh, this morning we're going to talk about hurdles to heaven. And there are some hurdles to heaven. And in fact, you interact with folks all the time who maybe just don't understand this whole Jesus thing. They don't understand why in the world you would show up to church on a Sunday morning. There's a lot of folks, even today, who doubt and have skepticism toward the whole idea of God. And there are some very real hurdles to heaven in their life. I've been working at the University of Arkansas, uh, and in the last three years since I've been there, we've seen 165 students make the personal decision to trust Jesus. And I tell you, every single one of them come with hurdles. Like all kind of hurdles that would keep them from trusting the Lord as their Savior. And today we're going to talk about that out of this incredible story in Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 15. I'm going to begin reading right here. It says, when one of those who reclined the table with him heard these things... He said, blessed is the one who will inherit the kingdom of God. i got to put a pause on it there and just explain to you what's going on. Jesus has been eating with some religious leaders of the day. And he's just been giving them a good talk, a stern talk, about humility. And all of a sudden, one of these religious leaders says, kind of with a scoff, ha, blessed will be the one who reclines at the table of the Lord. You see, Jesus has just been lecturing them on humility and all of a sudden, this guy just assumes that he is set and ready spiritually to go. Jesus, as he often does, then hits them with this parable. And a parable is nothing more than a story that communicates a truth. It starts in verse 16. Then he told him, I, I want you to underline that if you're taking notes. He told him, this was a story specifically geared to one person. A man was giving a large banquet and invited many. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who were invited, come, because everything is now ready. But without exception, they all began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I bought a field and I must go see it. I ask you to excuse me. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. I ask you to excuse me. And another said, I just got married. Therefore, I'm unable to come. So the servant came back and reported these things to his master. Then in anger, the master of the house told his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the city, bringing here the poor, the maimed, the blind, and the lame. Master, the servant said, What you ordered has been done, and there is still room. Then the master told the servant, Go into the highways and the hedges and make them come in, so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, not one of those people who were invited will enjoy my banquet. Let's pray. God, we love you and we trust you. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would speak to us through your word. Because we know you long to. And we pray that we would have ears to hear exactly what you have for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before we really dig in here, you have to understand that Jews understood that heaven would be an incredible banquet. In fact, you may know Psalm 23. Psalm 23 ends with this. It's David writing, saying, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. 
David was talking about that moment when he would get to heaven and would be exalted over all, even despite opposition in his life. You see, the Jews had this understanding of heaven as a large banquet, a celebration that never ended. And when we think banquets as Baptists, we think going over to the fellowship hall and eating a big meal. And that is true. But it was more than that. It was a party. It was a celebration. It was a season of thankfulness and excitedness for the harvest that had just come in. And typically, in most Jewish communities, there was a person who was known to be the rich man of the town or community. And this person, oftentimes, once a year, if the harvest was good, would throw a massive banquet and invite everybody. Now, about mid-season, you know if the harvest is going to be good. You know if the wheat has bore much fruit. You know if the cattle are looking pretty plump. And so you begin planning, even mid-season, we're going to throw a party. And I'm talking a party to end all parties. And so he would send word out, hey, the party's coming. And at the end of harvest, we'll send out a more personal invitation with the exact specifications, the date and the time. But when it's ready, will you be there? And he would get affirmation from folks. Of course I'll be there. I wouldn't miss this party. It's the party of the year. And so that's exactly this situation. When Jesus says the man was giving a large banquet and invited many, the invitation would have already gone out. Now, guys, we have never understood why for weddings there are actually two invitations. You know what I'm talking about? Like those ladies send out a save the date that has all the information already on it. And then a few months later, you get an actual invitation. To us dudes, it's just a waste of paper. We really don't understand it. But to you ladies, you put all kinds of time and effort and energy into those documents, and they mean a lot. These banquets were kind of sort of like that. But you would get this save the date well in advance, and then the actual formal invitation would come, and that meant everything was ready. At the time of the banquet, it says in verse 17, he sent his servant to tell those who were invited, come, because everything is now ready. Here's the first point if you're taking notes. Heaven is ready. You see, it says right here that there was a large banquet and he invited many. Uh, did you know this? That heaven is ready for you. It's ready for you now. It was ready for you yesterday. It's going to be ready for you tomorrow. Jesus said this in John chapter 14, that he is going to prepare a place for you so that where he is, you may also be. The moment you've made the decision to trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there is a place in heaven with your name on it. It is ready, it is prepared, it is set. The older I get, it seems like a month doesn't go by where somebody that I've known passes away. Oftentimes it's sudden, it's tragic, it's unexpected. I had a college student whose grandmother passed away last week. And I just texted him to say, man, I loved your grandma, one of the sweetest, most incredible ladies on the face of the planet, and she truly was. And he texted me back, and he said, man, she's been ready for this for a really long time. And there are some of you in the room who you may be ready for heaven. But let me give you a guarantee right from Scripture. Heaven is ready for you. It absolutely is. It's prepared. It's set aside. It's, it's set up. And here's the second truth. Not only is heaven ready, but heaven has room. It says in verse 18, he says, come, because everything is now ready. But they began to make excuses one by one by one. So the servant came back, I'm skipping to verse 21 now, and reported these things to his master. Then in anger, the master of the house told the servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the city and bring in here the poor, the maimed, the blind, and the lame. You see, there was so much room in this place. It was a large banquet. But there's something you need to know about heaven having room. There's a personal invitation that Jesus extends to you to heaven. Uh, did you know a lot of people won't join us in heaven because they've never been invited? Because nobody has ever told them personally what Jesus has done for them and given them the opportunity to accept him as their personal Lord and Savior. There's a personal invitation to you. Uh, Jesus is not so passive as to send a telegram. In fact, he comes knocking on the very door of your heart. It says here, he sends a servant to come out and beckon to come. It says, the master said, go quickly in the streets now. He's bringing here the poor, the maimed, the blind, the lame. Master, the servant said, 
What you ordered has been done, and there is still room. It is a false idea to think that heaven could ever be filled to capacity. It's for your neighbors, it's for your friends, it's for your co-workers. And the master told the servant, go into the highways and the hedges and make them come in. Some of your translations, particularly if you're reading out of the King James this morning, says compel them to come in. It's this idea, this concept that, that you're to beg folks, come and join me in this banquet to end all banquets. Compel them to come in. There's a thing that I didn't tell you about Jewish banquets. And it's this. That because a Jewish banquet was hosted by the richest of all the rich in the community, the one who could afford to put out the great spread for everybody, there had this idea that it was a bit exclusive. That the banquet was only for the select few, the richest of the rich. And right here, the master of this banquet says, go out and invite everyone. Oftentimes in these Jewish banquets, they would bring a gift of sorts. You see, the master of the banquet had set out from his plenty all of the stuff, the fattened calf, the, the wheat from the harvest. He had planned and prepared quite well. These folks couldn't pay anything. You see, they didn't have a, a gift to bring to the banquet of heaven. They're quite like you and I. When it comes to heaven, we don't have anything to put on the table. We don't have anything to offer. We don't have riches to throw down. But you're invited nonetheless. In fact, you may be in this room and you may have thought this whole Christianity thing couldn't possibly be for you. You're like, yeah, maybe for those folks, but could Jesus ever possibly care about me? Here's the incredible thing. In two instances, this servant goes to folks who never would have assumed to be invited to this banquet. He went into the alleys of the city, bringing in the poor, the maimed, the blind, the lame. I need you to understand something about these folks. They would have had to have help even getting to the banquet. There's a student in our ministry, one of my favorite students in all of Baptist Collegiate Ministry at the University of Arkansas. His name is Will Lambley. Will went tragically blind his sophomore year of high school. It was a degenerative eye disease, and it was fun getting to know Will throughout the course of his freshman year. Will memorized the campus. I mean, he's blind. Like, he was just a stick to walk blind. But there are certain times where Will gets himself into a bind, and he doesn't know how to get where he needs to go. He literally needs somebody to help guide him, particularly when it comes to driving. It's not good when he tries to do that. He literally needs somebody to steer him where to go. Did you know there are a lot of people searching for heaven that need to be directed where to go? And God, just like the servant in the story, has strategically placed you in lives and communities and families and friendships so that you can guide them the course to heaven. So he invited those in the alleys and in the byways, but then he goes a bit further. The master told the servant, verse 23, Go into the highways and the hedges. Now, these would have been the folks who couldn't afford to live in the city. In fact, these are the folks who literally live on the outskirts of town, the people who are outcasts from the community. He says, and make them come in so that my house can be filled. Heaven has room. There's room for everybody. There's room for you. There's room for me. There's room for your grandchildren. There's room for your mortal enemy. Here's the thing. There's an urgency to this invitation. You see, heaven is happening soon. The banquet was prepared. Everything was set. There will be a day when Jesus comes to bring all things to himself. When he comes to set all things right, it's happening sooner than you could ever imagine. There will be a day when death will come in your life. And whichever of those comes first, you will meet the reality of eternity. It will happen for you. It will happen. And on that day, there will be a great separation. It says that Jesus will judge the living and the dead. For those that have made the decision to trust Jesus as their Lord and Savior, he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant, and he will usher you into heaven. But for those who live their life apart from the Lord, they will spend an eternity separated from God in a place called hell. You see, there is a reality that there is a quick coming heaven approaching. It is happening soon. This is a banquet that cannot be filled to capacity, and we have a brief moment here and now to extend the invitation. And the thrust of this message is this. 
Yes, heaven is ready. Yes, heaven has room. The third, there are pearls to heaven. There really are. I don't know if you noticed this, but when the servant went out to re-invite those who had previously got to save the day, it says, but without exception, in verse 18, they all began to make excuses. The first one said, I've got a field and I must go see it. There's four hurdles to heaven. They're going to be listed on the screen behind you. The first is this. Number one, they must be invited. Uh, you notice several times throughout this story that the invitation went out time and time again. You have to compel people so that they can come and can experience the goodness of the banquet hall. The first hurdle to heaven is the invitation. In fact, y'all took that mission trip this past week just so that people could be invited to come and experience the good news of Jesus. This church gives strategically to missions and ministries. Why? So that you can extend the invitation to more and more people. There are hurdles to heaven. The first is this. They must be invited, but the second is equally as true. The second one is this field. Without exception, they began to make excuses. And the first said, I bought a field, and I must go out and see it. I ask you to excuse me. Now you may think, well, Ryan, I, my family used to farm, but I'm not a farmer. I don't have a field. That's not an excuse to me. Now, the field is not so much talking about a field. as It's talking about one distraction in our life that will keep you from missing God's best. It's stuff and possession. You see, this man had just purchased something that he was quite proud of. And what did he say? I bought a field and I have to go see it. Now, you all are wise business folks yourselves and would never make a dumb financial decision. This man, if he had bought this field, would have certainly already seen it before. So what is he saying? He's saying, well, I bought this. I just need to go look at it. My very first truck was half a 1994 F-150, half a 1996 F-150. And I say it was half and half because it was literally wrecked. And so we took the front half of the 96 and the back half of the 94, smushed them together, and it looked like it. I mean, the front half was white, the back half was green, and we never had the money to paint it. Like, it drove like that all the days of me driving it through high school. We called it the two-toner. Now, the first night I got the keys to my truck, I was proud of it, just like any kid that gets the keys to their vehicle is. And I can remember parking it under the street light outside the house. I parked it under the street light and I slept with my window open that April night so that I could see the gleam of the street light off the white hood of that truck. Now it didn't gleam off the green side, but it sure did off the white side. And I looked at it just to make sure nobody would steal it or vandalize it in the midst of the night. Now ain't nobody who's gonna touch that truck. <laughs> but have you ever had something like that? A possession that, at least for a season, you were so proud of, so thankful for, so excited about. You see, this man, it just bothered you. And his obsession with that stuff kept him from missing the banquet. There are going to be a lot of folks who miss heaven because of their obsession with accumulating things of this world. And they'll go all their life accumulating and accumulating, and they'll get to the end and realize they couldn't take it. Maybe for you, it's not the field. Maybe it's the oxen. You see, the next man in verse 19 said, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to try them out. I ask you to excuse me. The first man's obsession was with this stuff. The second was with not just a herd of oxen, but with what he could achieve, what he could do. I'm not sure about you, but this is the one that tends to strike me right between the eyes. You see, this man had just bought five oxen, and he had to test them out. Now, he wasn't planning to get any work done this night of the banquet. What did he have to do? He just needed to go and be with his ox, to just go and see him work the circle, you know, to see how these things could, could get some work done. There are some of you who are so obsessed with the things that you can accomplish in this life, the things that you can do, the wealth that you can accumulate, the accolades that you can place behind your name. Can I tell you, for this man, it kept him from experiencing the greatest thing of all. There are some people who will be so driven to achieve, to do and do and do, and they'll wind up dead just like the rest of us and will miss heaven because they spend all their time trying to achieve something when Jesus has already achieved the greatest thing. It's not just the field. And it's 
it's not just the oxen. It's not just stuff, and it's not just accomplishments and achievements. The next, in verse 20, said, I just got married, and therefore I'm unable to come. Now, if there was any that we were going to say was a valid excuse, we would kind of nod to this guy, right? Sure, we've all heard the mantra, happy wife, happy life. You just need to go be with your wife on this particular night. But let me tell you a couple things. First off, both of these events were prepared long ahead of time. The banquet and the wedding ceremony. In fact, you, if you've ever had a daughter get married, you know the extensive planning and the finances that are behind that particular event. Both of these events took quite a bit of planning. But secondly, there's something missing in this story that I think you all would understand. You see, the most honoring thing that this man could have done with his new wife that he had married some days or weeks or months before would be to take her to the swankiest event in all the county. And this was it. This was the banquet of all banquets, the place to see and be seen, the place where you were going to experience the best of the best. If there was any place he would want him and his new wife to be, it was this place. But this right here strikes at the heart of another distraction from heaven, another hurdle to heaven. It's relationships. You know, there are some relationships that will keep, ex keep people from experiencing the fullness of God's blessing. There are some relationships that will keep people from experiencing heaven and its totality. There are two ways. One, there are relationships that are distracting. You know this. The person that marries that person and who is dead set against things of God. And they'll pull them away from things of the Lord. I talk to college students all about this, why it's that important, who you determine to marry. But it's not just a person that may distract you from things of the Lord. There are other folks that may give you a false sense of security in things of the Lord. Let me explain it to you this way. I have college students all the time who say, all right, I'm good with that spiritual stuff. You see, my grandma went to church every single week. A lot of people assume that they can get to heaven based on someone else's faith. A relationship will be a hurdle to heaven for you. Because you have to experience a one-on-one -on -one relationship, an encounter with Jesus that is for you. You can't rest on anybody else's relationship with Jesus. You can't rest or trust in anybody else's relationship with the Lord. It has to be a relationship that you have one-on-one -on -one with God himself. You see, relationships are a distraction to heaven. It's a hurdle to heaven for some. But I'm not sure if any of you ran hurdles when you were in high school. Anybody a hurdle jumper back in the day? Uh, yeah, it was the hardest of all the track and field events. It really was. I mean, the hurdles when we had to run them were the things that we just ran through because we determined that it was quicker to run through them than to try to hop and jump over them, especially for the unathletic linemen like I was back in those days. I mean, it was just a bad situation. But here's the thing about all these hurdles to heaven. Every single one of them is a man-made hurdle. I don't know if you recognize this. The God from heaven above has not placed a single hurdle on you to experience him in his fullness in heaven. Every single one of these hurdles is a man-made hurdle. It's the obsession with stuff and the things that we can possess. It's our accomplishments, our accolades, the things that we can get done in this life. It's relationships that can distract us and be a hurdle in heaven for us. But you see, Jesus didn't place a single one of those hurdles on you. In fact, Jesus came, humbled himself, and took on the fullness of humanity for one reason, to break hurdles in your life. He came because he knew you could never climb to the heights of heaven. He came down to this earth, lived a life that was perfect, sinless, without fault. And he marched toward in his life a criminal's cross that he didn't deserve. And Jesus marched that cross and died fully on it. And you know my favorite thing about Jesus? He didn't stay dead. No, three days later, he rose victorious from that grave, proving that if you would trust in him, you could experience new life. You could experience the fullness of heaven. That's our last point, that there is a hope of heaven. There's a reality of heaven that we can put our hope in. I need you to catch this at the very end in verse 24. Remember, 
where Jesus began telling this story after a religious leader of the day leaned over next to him and said, Ah, isn't it going to be great when we're experiencing the blessings of the Lord in heaven? A bit haughty, a bit braggadocious. And then Jesus said this in verse 24, For I tell you, not one of those people who were invited initially will enjoy my banquet. This is what Jesus was saying. There are a lot of folks who are convinced that they have a relationship with God based on the stuff they do, the people they are, the background that they have. And he said, if these excuses, these hurdles exist in their life, there will be a lot of folks who think they're going to experience the fullness of heaven who miss it. There's a hope of heaven. Heaven is real. Heaven can't be filled to capacity. some far off place that you're going to experience when you pass from this life into the next. There is a reality of heaven here. You see, when you make the decision to trust Jesus, you experience a bit of heaven on earth. You have the Lord who sustains you, who guides you, who leads you through the most difficult of seasons. And there will be a day when you as well as I will pass from this life into the next. And for those of us who made the decision to trust Jesus, despite all the potential hurdles, there's a reality of heaven. The greatest celebration that you could ever experience. Your loved ones who are there, you're going to experience it with them. There's a hope of heaven. I'm not sure where your hope is today. Or if you've ever come to the point in your life where you made the decision to trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you're sitting in that seat right now and all you can think about are these hurdles. But Ryan, if I trust Jesus, does that mean I give up this stuff? Does that mean I, I have to leave behind these people? Does that mean that I have to quit focusing on these accomplishments, these accolades? Let me tell you what I told, told a college student in my office about six weeks ago. This was a student that had struggled with lesbianism, and she was really deep in that world, and she was she said, Ryan, I'm really concerned that if I make the decision to be a Christian, I'll have to give that up. And this is what I told her. And I looked at her just across the couch. I said, trusting Jesus does require giving some things up. And you feel like when you give it up, it's the greatest loss. You do, it does, for a moment. But Jesus turns around and hands you something that is so much better, so much more. Maybe folks in this room who you feel like you've been disconnected from your purpose, from what it is that God has for you. And maybe it's because of this. Maybe it's because you've refused to give some things up that God wants to take from you so that He can hand you His plan for you. And His plan is the hope of heaven. Today, there are some of you who need to make that decision to trust Jesus for the first time. And I'm going to ask in just a moment as we begin the time of invitation. When the first chord of that guitar strikes, that you would walk up here in boldness and you would have a conversation just about initiating that relationship with the Lord. Now, there's nothing about walking forward that could ever save anybody. Can I say this? Walking forward may be that first step of obedience for you into a lifelong, fulfilling relationship with God. Let's pray and then respond as you will. God, we trust you. We love you. And we believe, Lord Jesus. We have a hope of heaven that is real, that is tangible. We trust you with it, Lord. And we pray that as you move in our hearts, we would respond freely to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with us, if you will. If today you need to make a decision to trust Jesus, would you join me up front? And I would love, just during this song, to talk to you about that decision.
lady came and knocked on my front door, and she shared the gospel with my family. She asked this question first. She said, hey, do you attend church? And my mom lied and said, yeah, we go to First Baptist Church down the road, because there's always one of those down the road somewhere. And that was a lie, and she knew it because she was from First Baptist Church down the road. And she proceeded to share the good news of Jesus with my mom. Now, at the end of that presentation, she asked my mom a question. She said, based on what you've heard today, would you like to make the decision to trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And my mom said, no, emphatically. But what that lady didn't know, and my mom didn't know at the time, is directly the other side of the front door, I was sitting on the couch, and I heard every bit of it. And my heart just began yearning. And the very next Wednesday, I was at church, playing you First Baptist, just on the other side of the, the river, and I made the decision for myself to trust Jesus. There are some of you today who, in your heart, you just realize, I need to make that decision. And for some reason, you didn't come for it. I'm not judging you for that. This is what I'm saying. Would you find somebody to talk to about that decision in your life? Don't rest tonight until you get it settled between you and the Lord. I'm going to turn it over. Thank you guys so, so much for having me today. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much for sharing the Word of God with us this morning. Appreciate that so much. I know it was encouraging to me to hear that. And even this past week as he's sharing, I'm thinking about some of the conversations we had. And I know you'll listen more here about that next week. But uh, there were some of the, the, the very first night that we went out evangelizing, uh, Bobby and I were, were teamed together. And I mean, the first, I say door, we're not, not really a door to knock on, but the first conversation we got into was an hour plus long was a, a young man who was convinced beyond reason or doubt that his way of looking at the world through the Muslim faith was real. And he was ready for the discussion we had. You know, I don't know. He had every hurdle. He had every reason to believe what he wanted to believe. And I don't know if that man, that young man, will ever come to the Lord or not. He heard the truth that night. But there were also five other young men around that uh, and none of them were going to say anything because this, is, this guy was the one in charge. But there were five other guys who heard the gospel that day. And who knows uh, what God will do with that. Sometimes you're talking to him, who you're talking to. And if you have heard that this morning, I want to, uh, I'm so grateful you were here. Find me, find Ryan, find Alan. Find, I, this room is full of people who would love to do nothing more than talk to you about the wonder it is. Couple of things this morning before we are dispensed. I know the youth mission team is meeting this afternoon at uh, six o'clock over Cross Street, and uh, that, that's other way. Uh, Wednesday night, everything's up and running just like normal. We invite you to, to come here and be a part of our Wednesday night series with children and youth. There'll be a adult Bible study next Sunday. We'll resume our study of First Peter. We've been working our way through that the last uh, little while. So all kinds of opportunities. And if you are a Trusting the Lord this morning, if you are in fact a believer in Christ, I am hopeful that you will over these next few days be quick with the gospel and the invitation that we've heard this morning. Is there anything else that I don't need to talk about this morning? I don't think so. All right. Once again, thank you guys so much for praying for us that we're out last month, for this last week. If you would join, we'll be in rising, we'll be dismissed with this from Romans chapter 15. May the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord, you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.